All right, now that I'm recording, because I said I would record this session, could you repeat your question again for me? Are you saying it doesn't talk about formed elements in class? It does. So to address that question specifically, a formed element is a cell. Um, there are the thrombocytes, erythrocytes, and leukocytes, the, the platelets, the white blood cells, and the red blood cells. So from a formed element perspective, to say that the blood has cells and then also has formed elements in the plasma or the extracellular matrix is false. That's like saying there's cells and then and the, the extracellular matrix is made of cells. The extracellular matrix is not made of cells. It is not made of formed elements. Over there. They actually can occasionally have ducts. For the most part, though, they don't. Um, it depends on your scale of reference. Okay. The three ways to regulate calcium homeostasis. So in this class, we talked about three chemicals that regulate calcium. We talked about calcitrol, we talked about calcitonin, and we talked about parathyroid hormone. Calcitrol is the most potent form of vitamin D. Calcitrol allows for us to absorb more calcium from our digestive tract. So if we aren't getting enough calcitrol in our diet, we're not going to get enough calcium into our bloodstream from the food that we eat. We also have calcitonin. Calcitonin is a hormone that upregulates osteoblast activity and downregulates osteoclast activity. If we have too much calcium in our blood, we release calcitonin, and calcitonin will cause osteoblasts to be more active and take calcium from the blood and put it into our bones. Calcitonin will also downregulate osteoclast activity. It makes it so that we dissolve our bones slower and don't put as much calcium in our blood. And if we're struggling with too much calcium in our bloodstream, we don't want to add more calcium. We don't want the osteoclasts to be upregulated. We want to downregulate those osteoclasts. And then the third method is with parathyroid hormone, or PTH. For that parathyroid hormone, we release that when we have low blood calcium, when we need to get more calcium into our blood. Parathyroid hormone is going to act in multiple parts of the body. Um, but the most significant way that parathyroid hormone regulates blood calcium is by upregulating osteoclast activity. Ultimately, parathyroid hormone makes it so we dissolve our bones to put calcium and phosphorus into our bloodstream. Parathyroid hormone also makes it so we absorb more calcium from our urine and upregulates the synthesis of calcitrol so that we absorb more calcium from our digestive tract. But the thing I really want you to focus on with parathyroid hormone is the more PTH there is, the faster you dissolve your bones to add that calcium into your bloodstream. That's the big primary way it regulates calcium. So those were the three methods we primarily talked about in class. Um, there are, are many others, though. Calcitonin goes, takes calcium from the blood and puts it into the bone. Yes. A tissue. So bone ver as an organ versus bone as a tissue. An organ is defined as multiple tissues working together for a common purpose. So if we think of the femur, if we look at a whole individual bone, a femur, a vomer, a um, parietal bone, this whole bone 
has multiple tissues. It has dense bone tissue, it has spongy bone tissue, it has yellow marrow, it has red marrow. Those multiple tissues are all gonna work together for a common purpose. It meets the definition of an organ. But then you could also think of bone tissue. You can look at an individual kind of tissue in the bone. The compact bone tissue, the spongy bone tissue. So it depends on your frame of reference. If you zoom out and look at the bone as a whole, it's an organ. If you zoom in and look at one part of the bone specifically, it can be a tissue. Good question. Any other content questions? The main points of how to repair tissue, and I'm assuming you're referring to when we talked to the, in histology, just like soft tissue repair, not bony tissue, or not bone fractures. Okay, so when we talk about just soft tissue repair, step one is we have a blood clot and we have, so we stop the bleeding, and then there's going to be some vasodilation. Our blood vessels become more permeable. That allows for more white blood cells to be delivered to the tissue. The white blood cells can exit the blood stream. Step two is going to involve the generation, or the next step is going to involve the generation of that intermediate fibrous tissue. And then we take, the, at the final step, we take that intermediate fibrous tissue and replace it with the functional tissue that was there. And depending on our age, what we replace that fibrous tissue can vary. If we're young and we have lots and lots of adult or multipotent stem cells, we typically will regenerate functional tissue so we don't lose any of the function. As we age, we lose adult stem cells and our ability to regenerate is declined or depreciates. And instead of regenerating, we will instead have fibrosis form or scar tissue form. Now some of the tissues, so if we're thinking of like cutting your skin, um, the epidermis does a really good job of regenerating. So we are really good at regenerating that stratified squamous epithelium because there's lots and lots of adult stem cells in the stratum basale. However, if you look at the dermis with its dense irregular connective tissues, it has a lower concentration of adult stem cells and we lose the ability to regenerate that as we age. And that's one of the reasons why those cuts you get when you're a little kid, they fade over time and you don't have scars now as adults. But if you get a cut as an adult, it takes a very long time for the scar to fade. Um, so let's talk about the apocrine sweat glands versus the eocrine sweat glands. Um, apocrine sweat glands um, were initially thought to have the secretion style of apocrine secretion style. However, after initial, um, additional analysis was performed, it was found that the method of secretion wasn't what it was initially thought. We rediscovered that oh, it's not an actual apocrine secretion. They used the Merocrine method, but because they were, everyone was already calling them apocrine sudoriferous glands, the name has stuck and it's embedded in the literature. In the back. And ossification. Do you want to throw osteogenic stem cell in there too? Sure. All right, why not? So, Osteogenic stem cells are where it all begins. They are the adult or multipotent stem cells that turn into the blastoclastin sites. Of the blastoclastin sites, if we just look at a root word analysis, osteo means bone, blast means build, clast means destroy, and site means cell, literally. But in my head, I think maintain when I see site. An osteoblast builds up bone tissue. It secretes the calcium hydroxyapatate, and it pretty much buries itself in extracellular matrix. Once the osteoblast has been fully buried in extracellular matrix, it changes, it morphs, and goes from an osteoblast to an osteocyte, and will just maintain the cell, or maintain the tissue, I should say. 
Um, we also have osteoclasts, the bone destroying cells. Osteoclasts form when multiple osteogenic stem cells fuse together. This is significant because osteoclasts are one of the few um, multinucleate cells of the body. And then we have a very large cell with many nuclei moving around, dissolving our bone tissue. The osteoclast dissolves our bone tissues. And if you want more detail about any of those cells, let me know. I'm trying to keep it broad right now. And then finally, there's ossification. With ossification, we are adding mineral to the bone. We're making the bone. Another name for ossification is mineralization. In the back. Can you the key points of endochondral ossification? Sure thing. I'll give you the, the spark notes version. So with endochondral ossification, our long bones start out as a chunk of hyaline cartilage. As our long bones are starting out as a chunk of hyaline cartilage, the hyaline cartilage starts to turn into bone, starts to ossify in the middle portion, in the diaphysis. Shortly after we have ossification in the diaphysis, two additional ossification centers form in the epiphyses, the proximal and distal epiphyses. And then what we have happening is that piece of cartilage is being turned into bone, it's being ossified at three different locations at the same time, the two epiphyses and the one diaphysis. At the time of birth, there is a lot of extra hyaline cartilage left over separating the epiphyses and the diaphyses, known colloquially as the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate, to use the technical term. And then when we stop growing taller, all of the hyaline cartilage in the epiphyseal plate has been fully ossified and turns into compact bone tissue. And we go from calling it an epiphyseal plate to an epiphyseal line because there's a line of compact bone tissue. Would you like more detail? No, Okie dokie. So for intramembranous ossification, you have two chunks of smooth, or two pieces of membrane. So you have fibrous membranes. And instead of having th specific ossification centers with the long bone, you have, with long bone or endochondral ossification, we have the diaphysis and the epiphyseal ossification centers. In in intramembranous ossification, there are many dozens of ossification centers spread throughout. There's no one specific point where ossification will occur. And we have the blood in between the two membranes that starts to clot. Then we have the callus that then is going to be fully ossified to form bone tissue. Or to paraphrase, to really give you the bare essence of intramembranous ossification, you have two membranes that bone forms in between. No. So with endochondral artification, it starts as cartilage. With intramembranous ossification, it starts as a membrane and then goes to bone. I appreciate that follow-up question. Good question. Where do we have intramembranous ossification? Intramembranous ossification forms the flat bones of the body. So wherever we have flat bones, we're going to have a lot of intramembranous ossification. So if we look at the bones of the cranial vault, your frontal, your parietal, your occipital. There's lots of intramembranous ossification forming those flat bones. We also are going to have intramembranous ossification forming the sternum and intramembranous ossification forming the wings of the iliac or ilium. Yeah, that's a really good question. Since, the, the, like really with the appendicular versus axial skeleton, it's been basically a supplement to lab in lecture. How am I gonna ask you a question? Um, well, you're here for the review session. There's some perks to coming to the review session. Let me show you a couple of the top hat quiz questions that I copied and pasted into the exam bank. For the record, 
I copied and pasted six questions from those top hat quizzes into the exam bank because I want you to have a really good chance of being exposed to those questions if you've already gone through all the pain and effort of working through the top hat quizzes. Are those six questions ones that we'll for sure get or are they like randomized just like Randomized in the bank. I didn't have the ability to upregulate or downregulate individual questions. I wish I did. What I ended up doing is I have five question banks that are being pulled from, um, which is about as much detail as I could get. So let's go to those top hat quizzes. I'll show you an example of a question I copied, and I'll show you an example of one that I'm not going to ask, or a style that I'm not going to ask. So here's one of the low-hanging fruits. There will not be any true-false questions. Um, there's going to be at least A through D for your options, occasionally A through E for an option. This is a style of a question I would ask. Let's just unassign and present. So in this chapter, we talked about the numbers of bones. And we talked about how in adults, there's 206 bones in the adult skeleton, and there's more bones in the child or infant skeleton. So the more application type questions are going to be asked from the appendicular and axial. Wrong button. Let's show another, a few more examples. So let's see here. Cancel presentation. This is one of the questions that I copied and pasted. And we actually covered this one today during class. You cannot palpate the blank on a living person. So it's not asking you, what is the name of this bone? That's a lab kind of a question. Name the bone, name the bony structure. Um, in lecture, I want you to focus more on application of the material. So if you were paying attention during lecture and you were able to think, connect the dots, palpating is feeling. And then let's look at these bones. What can we not feel on a living person? We have the lateral malleolus. That lateral malleolus is also known as that bump on the outside of your ankle. You can feel that, no problem. When we look at the tibial tuberosity, that is going to be the anterior bump on the tibia directly distal to the kneecap. I'm having a brain hiccup right now. Anyways, dis directly distal to the kneecap, so you can palpate the tibial tuberosity. When we look at the tibia, you can palpate that anterior border. That's a sharp part on the tibia. The calcaneus is the bone of your heel. You can feel that. But if you think of the fibula, the fibula is always going to be located on the lateral part of your lower leg. You cannot feel the middle or the medial surface of the fibula on a living human being. There's the intermembranous or interosseous membrane protect, preventing you from feeling that. And there's also the muscles of the lower leg. So these are the kinds of questions that are going to be asked. They assume that you know the skeleton and can think about the parts of the skeleton. I said the appendicular skeleton wasn't going to be on the exam. I did. Let me double check. I believe I posted an announcement that said there was five questions from the appendicular skeleton. Oh. Oh. For that particular question that was worded very poorly, that will not be on your midterm. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. In the back. 
interstitial growth. What chapter are we talking about, or what topic? Uh, bone, elongation. bone elongation. So for interstitial growth, um, when we think of bone elongation with interstitial growth, we're going to have hyaline cartilage that makes up the epiphyseal line. Excuse me, the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. That hyaline cartilage is going to continue to divide and grow. As the hyaline cartilage of the epiphyseal plate grows, it pushes the epiphyses farther away from the diaphysis. And then we're going to have the ossification center within diaphysis that will be continually ossifying the hyaline cartilage. So that as the piece of cartilage grows thicker through the action of the chondroblast or the cartilage building cells, we'll have osteoblast turning that hyaline cartilage into bone tissue to make our bones longer. Any other additional questions? So there are two pigments we talked about, or just in the integumentary system in general. There's phenomelanin and eumelanin. Eumelanin is the dark brown black pigment. Phenomelanin is the yellowish red pigment. So if you remember the differences between the two kinds of melanin produced by the melanocyte, I could theoretically ask you, what kind of pigment is present in red hair? What pigment does somebody with brown hair have a lot of? And you could say phenomelanin or eumelanin. Or if they have white hair, they have neither. That would be an application style question. Can you say that louder, please, Caitlin? Yeah, so when people go gray or white, they stop producing the phenomelanin and the eumelanin. The difference between gray hair and white hair is how much air in the cortex of the hair. White hair will have more space, more air pockets in the cortex. Gray hair has less space or less air pockets in the cortex of the hair. Um, that's a badly worded question. Um, so in terms of how I would word that question, I would specify embryonic stem cells from the embryo or embryonic stem cells from the zygote or the early or the single cell that's been fertilized. So from the single cell that's been fertilized, they're totipotent. And then if you get from the embryo itself, they are pluripotent. In the back. It does? Oh, then the answer key was programmed in incorrectly on that top hat question. Osteogenic are bone creating cells. Genic means to create, osteo for bone. An osteogenic stem cell is a cell that turns into the bone cells, or we'll, we will create bone cells from. So I'm glad you brought that to my attention. Which question number is that? Sixty-nine. Number six of chapter seven. And escape.
of chapter 7. Osteogenic cells are bone stem cells that differentiate into osteoblasts and osteoclasts. That should be true. Let's go ahead and edit that question. Unassign and edit. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, not necessarily no, because osteoblasts do not turn into the osteoclasts. Osteoblasts come directly from the osteogenic cells, and osteoclasts come directly from the osteogenic cells. The difference is, are those osteogen is one osteogenic cell going to morph? If, it if one osteogenic cell is morphing, it'll go to osteoblast. If multiple osteogenic cells are fusing, it becomes an osteoclast. Any other questions? In front. Histiologic. Um, so a spread or a, it depends on how the tissue is prepared. If you slice it, um, that's going to be um, a histological slide. And that's kind of a broad term for histological slides. There's multiple ways to make tissue slides. You can slice them, you can smear them, or you can spread them. All of the above are histological slides. The slicing, the smearing, or the spreading. Histology loosely means to study tissues. So if you're studying tissue with it, it's a histological slide. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, yes. Let's talk about that one. Where are your sensory receptors located? In the dermis. So if you have a third degree burn and you lose your dermis, at the site of the third degree burn, after the burn has happened, you can't feel anything anymore. So it's not painful. Now, with that said, the act of getting a third degree burn hurts like a son of a gun. But once you have it, you can't feel anything. What about simple epithelial tissue? Do they all what? Yes. Yes. So if you're looking at a simple epithelial tissue, it is a one layer thick of epithelial cells on that tissue. And that one layer thick, if it's only one layer, that layer has to touch the basement membrane and be part of the apical layer on the surface at the same time. If it's stratified, the deepest layer will touch the basement membrane. The superficial layer will be on the apex or the surface or the apical surface. And then there'll be a lot of layers in between. Is it a pseudostratified epithelium? Hmm. Let's clarify. Which slide are you referring to?
Is this a slide? The second bullet point. Simple squamous, thin scaly cells, simple cuboidal, pseudostratified columnar. So when we look at pseudostratified columnar cells, every cell within pseudostratified columnar is going to have a different length. Some of the cells will be able to make it to the apical surface. Every cell does not touch the apical surface. So if we skip ahead and look at the pseudocolumnar slide, or pseudostratified slide, some of these cells go the entire length. Other cells don't make it to the apical surface. So this is kind of the hard to categorize section. It looks like it's stratified, but it's not. It's a false stratification or a false layering. There is only one layer of cells, but the cells have different lengths to them. So not all of them will make it to the apical surface. Question. Sure. Let's pause right there, though. Were there any other specific questions before we did that? In the back. No pictures. There will be written descriptions. So the different modes of secretion. Um, the short answer is, is there going to be budding? Is there going to be exocytosis? Or is the cell going to completely disintegrate for the three styles of secretion? Let's pull up, by special request, the review PowerPoint. We have about 20 minutes left of our review session. So, when we looked at the study of tissues for chapter five on histology, my main goals for you were that you would be able to categorize the four primary classes of tissues. Those are epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. You also need to be able to name the three embryonic germ layers. We have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And then also be able to talk about the adult tissues that are derived from each, when we think ecto, I want you to think outside. Those are going to be the layers on the outside of our body. So the integumentary, you know, our skin, that comes from the ectoderm. And then we have lots of sensory receptors, which are part of our nervous system. Our nervous tissue also comes from the ectoderm. When we look at the mesoderm, the mesoderm is the middle layer of the embryonic cells or the embryonic tissue. And that middle layer of embryonic tissues forms the stuff that's in the middle of our adult bodies. So think of the muscles, the blood, the cartilage, the bone, the stuff kind of in the middle of our bodies. And then the endoderm forms the innermost layer of tissues in our bodies. The if we think of the inside of our bodies, the, the most inside we can go is that tube you know, from our mouth to our anus, that tube that goes right through us. So when we think of tissues of the digestive tract, those tissues of the digestive tract come from the endoderm. Another tube that goes into our body that's the innermost of us is going to be the trachea or the windpipe. So when we think of tissues of the respiratory tract, that's also going to be from the endoderm. The next learning objective was to visualize three-dimensional shapes of a structure from a two-dimensional tissue section. And that was... Really, what we covered that in lecture. That was with the slides that had the macaroni noodles or the hard-boiled eggs being sliced. Depending on how you slice a three-dimensional object, you get a different two-dimensional picture. The two kinds of slices that are most common are cross-sections or longitudinal sections, abbreviated CS or LS. And then everything in between is going to be an oblique section. When we looked at epithelial tissues, we, I wanted you to be able to distinguish an epithelial tissue from other tissue classes. One of the key things about epithelial tissues is that it's avascular. 
of the four tissue categories, it's the only one that is avascular all the time. The other tissue categories will have some blood vessels present in them, depending on the specific kind you're looking at. And then another key characteristic of epithelial tissue is that it has very little extracellular matrix. So if you're looking at a tissue that has almost no extracellular matrix and no blood vessels, it's probably going to be an epithelial tissue. There are eight types of epithelial tissues, and this is based on the orientation of layering and shape. We can have stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar. We can have simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar. So that's six of them. And the remaining two are pseudostratified or transitional epithelium. I also want you to be able to talk about functional differences of these epithelial tissues. So if we have stratified epithelial, there's going to be multiple layers. Those multiple layers form really good barriers or boundaries and are going to resist abrasion. If it's one layer thick, so if it's a simple layering, it's typically going to be used for an absorption membrane or it's typically going to be used to make a secretion into a cavity. So when we think multiple layers, think boundary or abrasion. If it's one layer, I want you to focus on absorption across the membrane or making a secretion with that membrane. A good example would be, and the, really the classic example, is the stratified squamous epithelium of our skin. That has many layers of flattened cells to resist abrasion. Or you could look at the simple squamous epithelium in the alveoli of our lungs. That's one layer of thin cells that we can absorb oxygen across. Let's talk about connective tissues. When we look at connective tissues, connective tissue is the most diverse class of tissues. Um, it's kind of the miscellaneous category. Connective tissues are loosely described as having lots of extracellular matrix. And that's a key characteristic of the connective tissues. If there is a, a large amount of extracellular matrix, it's going to probably be categorized as a connective tissue. A lot of connective tissues will have blood vessels present in them, but not all. So it depends on the connective tissue you're looking at. For instance, the areolar loose connective tissue has a lot of blood vessels in it. How, uh, but on the other end of the spectrum, the hyaline cartilage has almost no blood vessels in it. It's categorized as avascular. So the presence of blood vessels isn't necessarily going to be a defining characteristic of connective tissues. What we really focus on is the fact that it has a huge amount of extracellular matrix. In terms of what kinds of cells are found in connective tissues, this is also going to have the most diversity of cell type. We will have a fibroblast, being a fiber building cell. We have blast clasts and sites that we've talked so much about, the builders, the destroyers, and the maintainers. And then you can use the, the prefix, such as osteo or chondro or fibro, to tell you what that specific cell works with. We also talked about um, just some of the other tissue types. We talked about the leukocytes. Uh, specifically, we talked about mast cells and how mast cells will release histamine to increase inflammation and make blood vessels more permeable. Uh, we also talked about erythrocytes and leukocytes and thrombocytes, the cells of the blood. Uh, we could prob I could probably monologue for about 20 minutes on just cells of connective tissues. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to move on to the next objective. What is the matrix of connective tissue and ha describe its components? When we look at the extracellular matrix of connective tissue, generally speaking, it's outside of the cell. Extracellular matrix, or the matrix, is outside of the cells, but part of the tissues. The cell is the smallest part that's alive. So if it's outside of the cell, it's the non-living component of the tissue. And there's two things that make up this non-living component. We have the fiber, and we have the ground substance. We have the scaffolding, and we have the liquid. The fibers are our scaffolding. The ground substance is the liquid. And depending on the connective tissue type, maybe we have lots and lots of fibers, or maybe we have lots and lots of ground substance. For example, 
Our tendons and ligaments are made of dense, regular connective tissues. They have a high concentration of collagen fibers in the extracellular matrix, a low concentration of ground substance. And then on the other end of the spectrum is blood. Blood is, well, the only liquid tissue at room temperature. And when we look at blood, it has almost no fiber in its extracellular matrix, but it has a ton of ground substance. The ground substance of blood is called blood plasma. So those are the two components of the extracellular matrix. Um, in terms of classifying the 10 kinds of connective tissues, we spent almost 50 minutes in class talking about the different kinds of connective tissues. We have the three kinds of cartilage. We have the bone tissues. And really, we could have compact bone or spongy bone. We have the adipose. We have blood. We have red bone marrow. There are lots and lots of diversity within our connective tissues. Let's talk about nervous and muscular tissues. These are grouped together as excitable tissues in that they can conduct electricity as part of their normal function. Um, to really differentiate these two, muscle tissue is the only tissue type that can contract. I'll say that again. The key defining characteristic of muscular tissues is that is the only tissue that can contract. When we look at both muscular and nervous tissue, they're both electrically active. Nervous tissue can send and receive electrical signals. Muscle tissue can only receive. We don't originate any electrical activity with our muscle cells. To originate that electrical signal, we need to use a nervous tissue to start the electric signal. In terms of what we talked about with nervous tissue, we talked about two, kind, two categories of cells, the neuron and the neuroglia. The neuron is the cell that will send and receive or create and receive those electrical signals within the nervous tissues. And then the neural glia are the support cell types. And we talked about um, them very briefly. Um, there are multiple neural glia. We'll talk about them in more detail when we get to the nervous system for our last unit exam. When we look at the muscular tissues, there are three kinds of muscular tissue, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. And they can be categorized based on location or some of the structural characteristics. Skeletal muscle is attached to bones or the skeleton. Cardiac is in the heart. Smooth muscle aligns hollow organs of the bodies or within our body. And when we look at skeletal muscle tissue, that skeletal muscle tissue has lots of striations and is multinucleate and has very long cells or very long muscle fibers in it. Cardiac muscle tissue can be either mononucleate or binucleated. It's going to have intercalated disc that connects one muscle cell, one cardiomyocyte to the next cardiomyocyte. And as we look at those intercalated discs, there's a special feature of the intercalated disc. It has a lot of gap junctions in it that allows for the cytoplasm of one cardiac muscle cell to flow directly into the cytoplasm of another cardiac muscle cell. This gives us the ability to have the electrical signal to go from cell to cell to cell. When one cardiomyocyte is activated, they all will become electrically activated within that chamber of the heart. And that's important. That gives us a smooth contraction of our heart. When we look at smooth muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue is mononucleate. It's fusiform or spindle in shape and has no striations associated with it. In terms of cell junctions, glands, and membranes, the junctions that hold cells together that we talked about in class were tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. Tight junctions are a watertight seal that holds multiple cells together that prevents liquid from going in between the cells. Desmosomes don't function to make a watertight seal. They just function to anchor adjacent cells together. There's another kind of desmosome we talked about called a hemidesmosome. The hemidesmosome is half a desmosome. Instead of connecting two adjacent cells, a hemidesmosome will take one cell and anchor it to a basement membrane. So we'll have a lot of hemidesmosomes in that basal layer of epithelial tissues. We also have gap junctions. A gap junction you can think of as a hole in the side of the cell that directly connects the cytoplasm of one cell to an adjacent cytoplasm. I also wanted you to know about glands. 
when we look at glands, our glands are going to have some general categories or general structures associated with them. We have the part of the gland that makes the secretion, and we have the tube that gets the secretion to where it needs to go. And we can categorize them based on if there's a single tube or branching tubes, or if there is a single part that makes a secretion, or if there's multiple parts that make the secretions. And then we had the different modes of glandular secretion. Um, the holocrine, the apocrine, and the merocrine. And as we look at those modes of secretion, those refer to whether the cell will have budding occur to make the secretion, if there's exocytosis to get that product out of the cell, or if the cell itself will go through apoptosis, self-destruct, and then have the debris secreted out of the gland. We also talked briefly about body membranes. Um, we have serous membranes in our body cavities. Those serous membranes are doubled, double layered membranes. The inner layer that presses against the organ is the visceral layer. The layer that presses against the cavity wall is the parietal layer. So if we looked at the pleural cavity, we could have the visceral pleura is the serous membrane that presses against the lungs. The parietal pleura is the membrane that presses against the thoracic cage. And that our lungs are contained within that double membrane. Let's talk about how our tissues can grow, repair, and regenerate. We have some modes of tissue growth. We can have hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is when cells become larger. And that's the most common method of cellular growth, particularly in adults. And when we think of hypertrophy, that could be your muscles getting bigger. As adults, if we get, gain bigger muscles, our individual skeletal muscle cells will get larger. We don't add to the number of muscle cells. The other mode of cell growth in adults, which is less common um, or less commonly thought about, is going to be increasing the number of individual cells. And this is typically going to be associated with when we have a regeneration event. So think of how we're constantly sloughing off our skin or we're constantly digesting the lining of our stomach. We have to constantly regenerate brand new cells to replace the ones that are lost. In terms of adult and embryonic stem cells, there's one kind of adult stem cell, and that is the multipotent stem cell. When we look at that embryonic tissue, there's two kinds of embryonic stem cells, the totipotent and the pluripotent. Totipotent can be part of a human being or part of the placenta and or umbilical cord. And then pluripotent will only be part of the human being. The thing that differentiates a pluripotent from a multipotent stem cell is a pluripotent stem cell can turn into any tissue of an adult. A multipotent stem cell um, can still differentiate, but it doesn't have as much flexibility. So an osteogenic cell can turn into any bone cell, and there's multiple kinds of bone cells, but we are not going to use an osteogenic cell to make a cardiomyocyte, to make cells of our cardiac muscle tissue. So those multipotent stem cells have limited flexibility, but they still do have flexibility. And then there's the new kid on the block, the induced pluripotent stem cell. That is an adult stem cell that's been harvested and reprogrammed to act like a pluripotent stem cell. And right now, in terms of medical research, most breakthroughs right now are occurring with the induced pluripotent, or IPS, stem cells because they're the easiest to harvest, they're the easiest to work with from a regulatory perspective, and if you're working with an induced pluripotent stem cell, you are guaranteed that that tissue that you generate will be accepted by the recipient. It has identical genomes to the recipient, so you have zero chance of donor rejection or graft rejection when you make a transplant with induced pluripotent stem cells. In terms of cell shrinkage and death, we can have atrophy. We'll finish up, we'll stop on this slide and then call a review session done when we're done with this slide. For modes and causes of tissue shrinkage and death, atrophy is going to be the shrinking of a cell. Apoptosis is going to be 
the destruction of a cell, the pre-programmed destruction of a cell. Necrosis is a broader category that refers to the death of a cell. And there's multiple forms of necrosis. Apoptosis is one of those forms. And then finally, how does our body repair damaged tissues? Uh, somebody already asked that question earlier. Um, to give you the abbreviated version, we first stop the bleeding. And if we're young and have a lot of some multipotent stem cells, we regenerate replacement tissues with the same function. If we're old and don't have lots of multipotent stem cells, we typically will generate fibrous scar tissue that doesn't have the original function. And we are out of time for our review session.